Let's pray together. Father, as always, thank you for the opportunity we have to gather to worship you in song and in reading the scripture. God, we want to, as we talked about last week, show your worth through our worship because you are worthy. And not only, God, are you worthy simply because of who you are, but what you've done. And that's what is so amazing about grace. It's you've done what you didn't have to do, but you chose to. And so God, we thank you for that. As we open up your word now, God, we ask you to help us to continue to worship, to continue to see how amazing it is, this grace that we've been talking about. And God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see it, to love it, and then to live in light of it. And as always, God, help me to communicate it in a way that honors you and is helpful. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as always, if you got a Bible, open it up to Ephesians chapter 1. We are in this series on Ephesians, and this is now our third week. And we're looking at this text in uh, Ephesians 1, 13, or not 13, 3 through 14, which I told you last week in the Greek is one long sentence. Uh, it's one long run-on sentence, but we are taking three weeks to look at it. And so we're gonna kind of pick it up in the middle, verses 7 through 10. But in your English translation, it probably has a period because we try to break it up a little bit. But we're looking at this subject of what God has done. Who God is, we praise him and what he's done. And what he's done is he has saved us in Christ. And again, as I said last week, we're talking about a subject that is very complex because we're talking about God. We're talking about the activity of God. And and we're talking about big kind of theological concepts and words, words like predestination and election and words like that. And so I recognize, as I said last week, that these issues are complex and there's no way that myself or really anybody else can describe them in a 30 or 40 or uh, minute message um, about you know, trying to get through this, which is why we also have a podcast. And Pastor David and I, uh, as we do every other week, recorded a message or a, a, an episode this week digging into this even more. So if you listen to that, you can go and listen to that podcast where we talked more about this concept But again, if you weren't here last week, I'll I'll kind of recap quickly for you. We looked at verses three through six, where Paul tells us to worship God. He's saying, blessed be God. And then he has done something. He has chosen us. He has predestined us. And we talked about the concept of that is God's grace, God having grace on us. And then what we believe here, what I believe is grace precedes faith. But like I told you, it's all right if you believe faith precedes grace, as long as we agree that those two things are necessary, that that it is important, that it is by faith or by grace through faith that we are saved, which we'll get into Ephesians chapter two. So again, we're gonna pick up right where we left off last week in verse six and go into verse seven. And this week, what we're gonna see verses seven through 10 is just, again, digging more into this concept of what it is that God has done. And not just what it is, but how he's done it. So let's go verse seven of Ephesians chapter one. I'm just gonna look at verse seven and eight and then we'll stop and chat about it. Paul says this, in him, which is in Christ, we have redemption. In him, we have redemption through his blood. I think it's pretty cool. It's almost like there is a God. We sang about his blood this weekend. So through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. I'm gonna read that again and I want you to say according to with me again. All right, here we go. According to the riches of his grace. That's the title of this week's message, according to. Then verse eight, he says, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So like I said, the title this week is according to, and there's twice in verses seven through 10 that this phrase according to happens. And and we're gonna break this message up almost into two parts, if you will, and look at both according to's. Because this phrase, according to, as I say often, is a preposition. 
And I just feel like, and I'm gonna say this until the cows come home, because apparently they never come home, right? Or Jesus returns, or I'm out of here. But prepositions don't get enough love. But they are huge in understanding not only how sentences work together, but by how God works. Because this word here, or two words, according to, in Greek, it's one word, is called a preposition of reference. It's referencing something. Another way you could say this is, this is, uh, it's referring to how something happened. And so he says, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, which is the forgiveness of our sins. Again, no one argues with that, or no one within Christianity argues with that. We all believe it is in Christ, which is a key tenet of uh, really the Protestant faith. There's five parts, what's called the five solas, and that's five alones, and it's grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. And so it's by grace, through faith, in Christ. So the in Christ part, again, no one really argues about, as I say all the time. The reason why Christ is the only way is because he's the only one. He's the only one who's done something. Well, what has he done? Paul tells us here, he has redeemed us. Now, redeemed may feel like a real churchy word, but it's not. It's a word that we use all the time. Because to redeem something means you pay for something. You pay for something and then get something. It's like just checking out, right, at a, uh, at a grocery store. At a, you pay something, you are giving them money, and then you're getting something. But the idea of redeeming goes beyond just paying something. It is you're paying to get something back. You're paying to get something back like a ransom. So think about it that way. Something has been taken and someone is requiring you to pay for it to get it back. Which therein lies the evil of the whole scenario. You're like, but, but it's mine. I shouldn't have to pay to get something back that's mine. You're right, you shouldn't. But here's what's amazing. But God did. God did. God paid to get something back that was already his. Imagine if God was up in heaven and he's like, I don't pay, it's mine. I ain't gonna pay for it. Well, that would be leaving us in our trespasses and sins. What makes this so amazing, and again, we'll get into the according to part, what makes this so amazing is God didn't have to pay for something that was already his, which was humanity. He made us, he created us. But in Christ, it says he redeemed us. He paid the price. He paid the price for our ransom to get us back. How did he pay it? He paid it, it says, through his blood. I mean, think about that. It's one thing to pay money. Let me say, it's one thing to pay it with the green, but to pay it with the red? I just thought of that. I think that's pretty good. I'll be honest with you. That's why I love preaching. I come up with things as I preach. God just didn't dole out the money. He didn't just dole out the dollars, right? I mean, that alone would have been amazing. No. He paid it through his blood. Christ shedding his blood on the cross, redeemed us. Now here's where the first according to is so important. Why in the world would God do that? I love how Paul says it. He says, because he did it in reference to, preface this in reference, remember that, according to the riches of his grace. According to the riches of of his grace. And then verse eight, I love this, which he lavished upon us. Who here wouldn't just love it for a rich person to lavish some stuff on you? Right? Yeah, you can raise your hand. I know we're in church. You're like, no, I would just love to spend time with Jesus quietly in the corner. Hush up, you liar. 
Of course. Who wouldn't want a rich person to be like, you know what? I like you. And according to my riches, I'm going to lavish things on you. That's fine. Lavish all day, baby. And this isn't the same word, but this is what I keep thinking about. When I see the word lavish, really when I say the word lavished, I think of the word lather, like lather up. You know you have a good soap when it lathers up. You know what I mean? I gotta be honest with you because I have a soap that I like. This is getting really weird, but I'm gonna say it, all right? I have a soap that I like and the soap that I like, it doesn't take much for it to like suck, to lather up, you know, because I kind of got a lot of square footage, right? That we're trying, to, we're trying to get clean. And I'm one of those dudes, like if I was on Survivor, you would vote me off after two days just because I smelled bad. Like, I don't just go from, like, I smell good to smelling bad. I go to smelling good to funky, right? I mean, I just go right there. It don't take much. And so to me, a good soap is one that, that it doesn't take much to lather it up, and I can actually see it, right? I can see the bubbles. Well, I live in a family who, it's like those Old Spice commercials. They'd be taking my soap, and I don't understand it. So here lately for the last week or two, I've been having to use Lindsay's soap. And I don't know if there's a difference between men's soap and women's soap, but I, all I know is this one, don't lather. And literally it takes like seven pumps. I, I feel like I'm using like a 10th of the bottle just for it to lather. And then I'm putting it on and halfway through the square footage, I'm like, what happened? Right? You never thought you'd hear a sermon about soap as it relates to the grace of God. But go with me here. God, his grace is so great. He's so rich in his grace. He has the best soap. He he just lavishes all over us. Again, Lord, I hope this isn't offensive to you. But I want you... Think of the idea of it covering. What's it covering? What's it cleaning? Your sin, your dirt, your shame. This isn't one of those that after you get out, you still can smell the BO. No, this is after you get out, you smell sage and juniper, and you're like, smell like I'm in an Irish spring. That was a good soap. I don't care what you say. But here's what, I'm, here's what I'm saying. This is why, and this is why I said last week, I'll say it this week, I'll say it every other week. You want this to be according to his grace, not your faith. Because his grace, if it's according to his grace, there's a richness that's available. So much, I love how, I mean, Paul didn't have to use this word. But he says, according to the riches of his grace, which he, God, lavished upon you. I think we fail to understand God's heart. God's not a God that gives grace in like stingy portions. This isn't like eating ice cream or cookies at my house. I'm like, you better not take a big piece. Listen, in my house, it ain't by grace, it's by works. You better get out and work. And you better bring home some cookies, right? We just had this conversation last night. Brought home some Chick-fil-A cookies, you know, doing the, trying to support the local charities, right? And so instantly my kids start divvying up. You know, there's six cookies. Okay, you get two, 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 whatever. And I'm like, no, dad gets four, y'all get two, all right? That's how this works in this house. And I'm a good father. You can say, I'm not. My kids don't have to get a cookie at all. But but you know what I'm not doing? I'm not lavishing cookies on my kids. We've done talking about cookies and soap. It might be the greatest message known to man, all right? Why? Because I'm not rich. I don't have endless money to go buy endless 
cookies. So guess what? My kids don't get lavished in cookies or anything else because I don't have an endless supply of riches. But here's what's amazing. You want to know why God lavishes grace? It's because he does have an endless supply. He's never going to run out. He is infinite. So therefore, so is his grace. Can I just tell you something? God never gets tired of giving you grace. So here's the, here's the, here's the inference. You should never get tired of asking for it then. You should never get tired of asking for it. Because if you're now in him, if you're in Christ, you have redemption. Here's, why, here's how Paul makes the argument in Romans 8. He says, if God didn't spare his son, will he not also give us all things? Like, like do you think God's like, oh, I can't give you that. No, Paul's argument in, Paul, in, in, Paul, in Romans is he gave you his son. He already did the hardest thing. Why wouldn't he not also give you all things if he gave you Christ? So here's what I'm, I'm trying to show to you. We want this to be according to his grace. Because if it's according to his grace, it's endless. It's limitless. If it's according to my faith, it's finite. So let me give you this first point. And I gotta move on or I'll keep talking about soap and cookies, all right? We have redemption according to his riches. We have redemption according to his riches. That's the argument. It's according to his grace. It's according to his grace, which he lavishes upon us. Now, I'm going to go to Colossians 1 twice in this text to show you both according to's because Paul wrote Colossians, and so therefore, there's some similarities. So I want to show you because the same phrase, according to and redemption, occurs in Colossians 1, 9 through 14. Here's what it says. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. This is Paul talking to the church at Colossae. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Now listen to this. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power. Here's the phrase. What's the next two words there? According to. Same preposition of reference. According to his glorious might. It's another way of saying his glorious grace. According to his glorious grace. For all endurance and patience with joy. Here's the thing. If you need patience, you need endurance, you need joy, it's gonna be according to his grace not according to your works, not according to your ability to do this, but according to his ability to do it for you. So you gotta ask for it. You gotta ask for grace. Now he goes on. Look at this. For all endurance and patience with joy, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Let me stop there for just a sec. He has qualified you. Qualified, that's an interesting word. You're up to the task now, you're qualified. It's like you have a resume that qualifies you for the job. And here's what's key, this is why I think grace precedes faith. Watch this, it's not my faith that qualifies me. It's his grace. His grace qualifies me because Paul just put the emphasis on this is something that God did. He qualified us. How? According to. Now he goes on last verse, verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us. Listen to all the, who's doing the work here? He has delivered he has transferred. Who's doing that? God, by his grace. Transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, verse 14. Here's the same phrase as verse seven. In whom we have redemption. 
Same phrase. The forgiveness of sins. See, we have redemption according to his riches. We are redeemed by God's ability, God's wealth. And this is what's amazing. This is even how Paul argues in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 when he's trying to get the Corinthian church to give to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem when he says, God, being rich in mercy, did not con- Jesus didn't consider, well, that's Philippians, sorry. I get my, my verses mixed up. When he says, though he was rich, though for your sakes he became poor so that in him you might become rich. Philippians said he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be held on to. See, God is trying to share the lavish, the riches of his grace on you. So it's according to grace, the riches of God's grace. Now let's go back to Ephesians 1, verse 9 and 10. Again, remember, this is all one sentence. So we end verse 8, which he lavished upon us in wisdom and all insight. Verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will. What's the next two words there? According to. That's why I titled the message this week. According to his purpose. So the first one was according to his grace. This one is according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, the first according to, Paul's talking about how we are redeemed, how we are saved, how we are justified, how we are made right with God, how we are qualified. I mean, I could word after word after word. We are redeemed according to the riches of his grace. Now, one of the pushbacks that people have, and it's fine to, to have had many conversations this week, last weekend and this week, because the moment you start talking about predestination and the moment you start talking about election and God choosing and all these kinds of things, invariably other questions come up. That's totally fine. It should. It's a complex doctrine. But one of the pushbacks people have is, well, if God chooses, then we don't have free will. And we have free will. I've said that too many times. The Bible does not say that God's sovereignty cancels out human free will. No, you have free will. And guess what? You freely choose. The problem is you only freely choose sin, which is why God has to choose you so that you choose something different, all right? But you freely choose. You are freely choosing every day. God has not predetermined every single choice you will ever make. That is not how the word predestination is used. In fact, if you go back and look at it, I didn't say this last week, but it's predestined to adoption. It's not talking about he predetermines every human choice. That's not the point. The point is, no, he chose you and then he predestined you and he determined your destiny is another way to say it. After he chose you, he determined your destiny to be in Christ, to be saved, to be holy, to be his, all right? So the pushback that people have is like, well, if God chooses, then man has no responsibility. Again, wrong, because you freely choose sin. But people will say, well, then I don't have to evangelize, right? I don't have to share my faith. I don't don't have to do anything. God's gonna do it. Wrong again. Why? Because that is not the purpose of why he saved you. See, there's a second according to. He saved you according to his grace, but watch this. He also saved you according to his purpose, which was to enact his plan. So let me say it to you like this. Here's the second according to. First, we have a redemption according to his riches. Now check this one out. 
We have a plan according to his purpose. So we have redemption according to his grace, according to his riches. Now we have a plan according to his purpose. See, I love that Paul doesn't let us off the hook. This is why when people say, why should I share your faith? Because if you read your Bible, that's the plan. That's the plan. God sovereignly decreed that they would be chosen through you speaking. And so these aren't in conflict with each other. So I want you to understand. That's why Paul says in Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you confess your mouth, right? Believe, you will be saved. Well, how can they confess unless they hear? How can they hear unless someone speaks? How can someone speak unless they are sent? So God, watch this. God's sovereignty is not in conflict with our responsibility to execute the plan. Why? Because it's according to his purpose. I love that Paul says that God made this mystery over 28 times in the New Testament. The word mystery is used 21 times. It's used by Paul. What is this mystery? We'll get into it in Ephesians 3, but Cliff Notes version is the mystery is that Gentiles are co-heirs with the Jewish people. As I've said many times, salvation is not just for the Jews, but it is from them. Jesus Christ is the Jewish Messiah. And this goes all the way back to Genesis 12 with Abram. When God saw, or Abram saw what God promised him, he says, look up. Your sons will be as many as the stars. Every family on earth will be blessed through you. See, God always saw that every, that grace was coming to all, but it had to not just come to someone, it had to come from someone. Does that make sense? So grace was always coming through the Jewish people, which is why we should honor and respect them. That's what Paul argues in Romans. But it was never just for the Jewish people. Why? Because God was executing his plan, which in the craziness is his plan was to execute his son. And this is what's so important to understand. If you misunderstand this, you will misunderstand why we are still here. Because if God just saved you according to his riches and that was it, he should just zap you right up to heaven. But if you're in Christ and you're still here, which I know you are because you're here, you ain't there. As I've said many times, if you ain't dead, you ain't done. He saved you not just according to his riches, he saved you according to his purpose, which was for you to fulfill his plan. What was his plan? Matthew 28. Go into all the world and make disciples. That's his plan. And here's where I think a lot of people get really messed up in theology because they say, well, if this is true, then this must be true. No, it's as if, well, if God chooses, man's not responsible. Where'd you get that idea from? Well, if God is sovereign, how could you have free will? Where'd you get that idea from? The Bible says, no, both are true. But here's why I want you to understand why I believe, and most theologians that believe this doctrine would agree, grace, according to grace or grace preceding faith, shouldn't make you less evangelistic, it should make you more. It shouldn't make you less of a purpose, it should make you have more of a purpose. It, it shouldn't lead you to be less uh, down with the plan of God. Like, it shouldn't make you more passive, it should make you more active. Because here's what's amazing. God, by his grace, and this is what I was trying to say the first week, if God can save Paul, God can save them all. I'm not saying he will save all. And what I mean by that is not a number. I mean the type or the kind. God can save any kind of person. He can save the most evil person that you can think of. Well, I don't know about you, but doesn't that give you confidence? It gives me confidence because here's what I know. It's on 
God. It's according to the riches of his, let me say it like this. The riches of God's grace are more than the poorness of anybody's goodness. That makes sense when I say that? Let me say it like this. The riches of God's grace can take any bankrupt, bankrupt person and make them wealthy. So their bankruptness doesn't cancel out his wealth. So therefore, believers in Jesus should be the most purpose-driven, plan people there is. We should be the most type A. And I don't mean that just from a personality perspective. But what I'm saying is this. We should, watch this. This goes back to our last series. You're going to love this one. We should be the best stewards of our time. Because we weren't just saved according to riches. We were saved according to purpose. Here's what that means. You have a purpose. And your purpose is to get down with his plan. Well, I thought my purpose was just to get a job and make some money and get married and have 2.5 kids and drive a minivan and then retire and play golf for the rest of my life, right? I thought that was the plan. That might be your plan. That ain't his plan. I'm not saying any one of those things are bad, especially the playing golf part. That's fine. But here's what's different. When you're out there, your purpose isn't just to sink a putt. Your purpose is to point people to a person, Jesus. And you can do that through golf. You see what I'm saying? But here's what's crazy. How much time Do we waste trying to execute our own plans? We weren't, when we weren't saved according to that plan, according to that purpose. See, here's where a lot of Christians get wrong. We say, God, here's my plan. Would you bless it? Instead of asking God, God, what's your plan that you've already blessed? And how can I accomplish your plan in my life? Because I'm a teacher. I'm a businessman. I'm a policeman. I'm a fireman. I'm a postal worker. I'm a secretary. And God, I want to be down with your plan. Which, what is your plan? I'm glad you asked. Look at back at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter one, we're gonna skip down to verse 24. I love, I mean, I love the Bible. I love Paul. Listen to what he says. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I didn't think anything was lacking. Paul's not saying something was lacking in the salvation. Paul was saying there's something lacking in that The church is now the body of Christ, which means the church still has more suffering to do. We are now the body of Christ. That's what he says. Look, afflictions for the sake of the body, that is the church. Now watch this. Of which I became a minister. Now what are those next two words there? According to. Come on, baby. Let's try that again. You know I get excited. I became a minister what? According to. Now just because God is cool, look at. To the what? We just did a series on that. According to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. Okay, what is it? What is it? Let me say it like this. What is the stewardship? I told you the word stewardship is a Greek word, economy, where we got an English word, economy. What is the plan? What is it? Why was God, why was Paul made a minister according to the stewardship. Here it is, to make the word of God fully known. Watch this. That was the purpose. Paul was saved, not only according to the riches of grace, but according to the purpose of God. Let me say it like this. God didn't just save Paul for Paul. Just because I love alliteration. He saved Paul 
so that Paul would speak to all. Let me tell you the same thing. God didn't save you just for you. He didn't save you just for you. His grace wasn't just for you. Let me say it like this. His grace was never meant to become a cul-de-sac in your own heart. His grace was never meant to become a stagnant pond of your own life. It was meant to come to you and go through you. Way back in the day before we had our permanent locations that we have now in Jasper and Canton, we had offices down in Holly Springs. We were meeting at the Cherokee County Conference Center. We were setting up every week. We had offices down in Holly Springs. It was crazy. It was in the back of this industrial park. And whoever designed this industrial park built it, um, I, I guess not understanding how roads work or just didn't expect the growth because they built it and it went to a cul-de-sac. Well, then at the end of the cul-de-sac, there was a road. And so here's how we used to tell people to get to our offices. Go to the cul-de-sac, instead of turning around, go through it. And then you go through it and down. Those of you who are part of our church back then know this. You go through it and down and around and then there's our, our church offices. And people were always like, what? But now that I think about it, what a great example of grace. The grace was never meant to cul-de-sac in your own house. It was meant to come to you to go through you. Here's what I'm saying. You and I were saved according to a purpose. Why should you and I continue to make known the word of God? Make it fully known? It's because that's what you were saved for. That's not how you were saved by or what you were saved by, but it is what you were saved for. So please quit asking if God is sovereign, why do I have to share my faith? Because he told you to and he saved you to. That's why. And no, it doesn't cancel out your responsibility. Paul goes on. Look at this. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them, God chose, there's that word, to make known how great among the Gentiles, this is what I was referring to earlier, the mystery, are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. Every nation on earth, God's grace is coming to. That's the plan. Take his grace to all the nations. That's the mystery that was revealed. So this is what Paul says. Look at verse 28. I love this. Verse 28, 29. Him, Jesus, we proclaim. Check this. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Verse 29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy. Not my energy, his energy. Not by the energy of monster. Some of y'all got that. That he powerfully works within me. See, it's according to grace, but it's according to purpose. God gave his grace to you so his grace would go through you to someone else. That's the plan. And I love how Paul says here, he says, warning everyone and teaching everyone. Well, but hold on. You just said that God is the one who chooses them. You're right, I did say that. But let me say this to you. How do you know which one that is? You don't. And here's what I want you to hear me say as lovingly as I can say it. You're not meant to. Because you ain't God. So guess what? Just tell everyone and make the assumption they are chosen. Because here's what we know. God can save them all, can he? So here's what I'm saying to you. How about you quit predetermining who is available to his grace? <laughs> Instead, realizing that you didn't deserve it either. And just because they don't deserve it doesn't mean you shouldn't give it. Because he gave it to you when you didn't deserve it. You see what I'm saying? And this is what amazes me about Christians. 
This happens all the time. People are like, I don't like that church, it's too big. Okay, I get it. Sometimes smaller, it's fine. It's personalities, you know, I'm fine with that. But sometimes inherent in that is we don't want them here. Well, hold on. Aren't you glad we made space for you to be here? I mean, aren't you glad we have a Thursday night in Canton so that if you can't come on Sunday, you can come on Thursday? Right? Yeah. So how dare we limit who can come? Because it ain't up to you. And here's what's amazing. I'm going to let you know something. We are going to tell people that you don't like. And we're not going to ask you if it's okay to tell them. Well, I don't like them. Well, I guess you're going to hate heaven then. Be a lot of people in heaven you don't like. Thank God by grace, you'll be a perfected version of yourself there too. But here's what's crazy. Did you ever think that there's people that don't like you? <gasps> what? Yeah, do you ever think that somebody might actually attend on Thursday because you attend on Sunday? Or someone might attend at the 11.15 because you show up at the 9.30 like, ooh. See, here's his plan. His plan is to unite all things in him. The word there, unite, means to sum up. To sum up. Here's what's amazing. The only other time that word is used in the New Testament is Romans 13, 9. I don't have it on the screen, but you can look back later as a reference. Here's what Paul says. He says, you can sum up all the commands of God with this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't it interesting that those two words, only two times it occurs in the New Testament, God is trying to sum up all things in Christ. And how does he do that? By his people summing up everything they do by loving one another. See what I'm saying? Now, you can't thwart the will of God because you're not that big and bad. But here's what you can do. You can get down with it. You can get down with the will of God. You can live your life according to his purpose, which means you're going to live your life by his plans. Let me say it like this. You're going to live life the way he says. Because that's what he's saying. And this is <laughs> another reason why I don't, let me say it in the positive. Another reason why I like saying grace precedes faith, because check this. If grace precedes faith, then you owe everything to God. Who are you to argue with him about whether or not you should obey? Well, God, I don't like that commandment. I just turned it to somewhere. I don't like that one. You mean I got a tithe? You mean I got to forgive? How many times, God? Well, I'm spitting everywhere. Jesus says 70 times 70. Okay, so 100, 490? No, completely. What? See what I'm saying? But unfortunately, if faith precedes grace, then we're like, well, God, I mean, I chose God. And if I chose God, guess what? I can choose what commands of God I get to obey. See, if it's according to faith, then watch this. <laughs> it's almost like you get to decide whether or not you continue to exercise faith. Because you had a part to play in the matter. But if it's according to grace, guess what? You didn't have any part to play in the matter. Let me say it to you like this. The more you understand it's according to grace, the more you'll live your life according to purpose. That's how Paul's connecting them. You want to know why I'm a pastor? I've said this many times. I'm a pastor, and this is the God's honest truth which I don't know if there's another kind of truth, okay? I thought every Christian became a pastor. And it's not like I was hoodwinked. 
Because here's what I thought. If he gave his life for me, why would I not freely give my life to him? Why would I not say, God, it's your, you saved me. I have said this a many of times. I'm like, God, remember, you got me into this. I didn't choose this. I was gonna work for my father who owns an air conditioning company. My brother works for him. My sister works for him. That's what I was gonna do because I kind of like my father. I was gonna be about my father's business, but guess what? God saved me. He's like, you got a different father, so therefore you got a different business. Now, my father does air conditioning. doesn't mean I couldn't do air conditioning and still follow the plan and purpose of God because my dad does. My dad is the chairman of the deacons of his church. My dad is one of the most generous people I know. He makes money to give money. Because whether you're a pastor or whether you're a business owner, you're still saved according to purpose, to the plan. And what's the plan? The plan is to make the word of God fully known. The plan is to warn everyone and teach everyone. And check this, and struggling with all his energy in you to make it known. I don't know about you, that sounds awesome to me. And I used to joke with our security team, I had to quit doing it because they get freaked out. I'm like, I would love to die preaching. I'd love it. Be like, according to, right? Because I want to go out executing the plan. Is this not what Jesus said in the parables when he said, you don't know when he's coming, so be ready? So here's what I'm saying, and we'll be done because we got to go. But if he has saved, he's saved you according to grace, he's also saved you according to purpose, so quit wasting for why he saved you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you saved us according to the riches of your grace. It's by grace you lavished on us. And God, I pray that we would also see that you saved us according to purpose, according to your plan. And that purpose was not just to save us, but it was to save us so that through us, you could save others. Because grace comes to us and it's meant to go through us. So God, I pray that that would happen. But God, I pray right now for anybody that is here or watching or listening that has never responded to that grace in faith and been saved. I pray, God, you'd open their eyes right now by grace, according to the riches lavish on them right now so they can respond in faith. No one looking around or talking here as we close. But if you've never trusted in Jesus, then today you can respond in faith according to this grace. So if God is opening your eyes and you want to trust Jesus and be saved, you can pray with me. You don't have to do it out loud, but it goes like this. Say, Father, thank you for loving me that you sent your son in my place for my sin. Thank you for opening my eyes to see the truth for your grace. Now I respond in faith, trusting in Jesus to save me. Forgive me of my sins. Redeem me in Christ. Again, no one looking around or talking, but if you just prayed to trust Christ and you're in one of our physical locations, would you just simply lift your hands up so we could see that? We got men and women that are here gonna put a Bible in your hand. And when they do, you can put that down. Thank you. But then those of us who have trusted in Jesus, again, I want you to know that if you're saved by grace, it does not mean that you're not responsible to obey because you've been saved for a purpose, according to a purpose, because God's got a plan and his plan is to send you, to send you to make the word of God fully known, to send you to warn and teach everybody. So, be reminded today that he didn't just save you according to grace. He saved you according to purpose. 
and maybe you feel like you haven't been living according to that purpose, just ask him, God, how do you want me to live out this purpose? What is your plan for my life? That's what I want to get down with. Father, we thank you. There's no one like you. We thank you for your grace. And God, I pray that we would not only respond in faith, but we would live a life that corresponds with the grace that we've received by living out of the purpose for which you saved us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church.